The opinions expressed on the following audio program are solely those of the host and the guests. Burner Podcast is an independently produced, not-for-profit show and is not associated with the Burning Man organization or its subsidiaries. The views expressed are not representative of the entire Burning Man community and are presented here for entertainment purposes only. In short, calm the fuck down. It's just a podcast. When you're going to make more. Yeah. So what do you do with the rest of it? Right? Like, do you yeah. stay at that level or do you jump up every time you get a pay raise? Obsessively so, pack it so, away until you're a billionaire. Yeah, there you go. There you go. <laughs> and save it for future generations of like people. A dragon sitting on a pile of gold. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'm going to do visual. I'm going to do the intro thing here. Uh, hey, it's episode number 139. Oh, by the way, I get into like showbiz mode when I do this part. <laughs> It's episode number 139, and it is 126 days till the man burns. As of this particular recording, today's episode is going to be all about default world stuff like money and business taxes and ethics and all that crap. So... Taxes. Fun. Yeah, yeah, we might talk about that. It's okay. <laughs> exciting. We just passed it. Returns. <laughs> just so I can get this hippie shit out of my system and not use words like alignment and synchronicity for the next two fucking hours, I'm going to share with you a real quick story about alignment and synchronicity coming up on almost a decade of doing this podcast uh, i can't explain to you how this works or why it is or even how it does what it does but the set and setting of the interviews we record do have a noticeable effect on the end result of the podcast that you hear Uh, when i started this show i did it almost Almost exclusively out of my studio apartment. You were you actually came there for yeah, some of you. Yeah. yeah. First uh, time I was on, yeah. Yeah. But these days I will wait and wait and wait till the right location makes itself known. Uh, we had this episode booked and the guests you'll be hearing drove from far and wide mostly. Uh, But as of yesterday, I still hadn't landed on where we wanted to do the recording that you're hearing right now. Uh, Through a long series of impulses and happenstances, which I will not bore you with right now, I ended up on a walk with a friend in Baboa Park in San Diego. Which, by the way, side note, uh, Baboa Park is bigger than Central Park. Just so you know, New York, get over it already. Uh, <laughs> anyway, I'm, I'm having the. I have a. I have a very slight beef with New York. It's not like it's not like a big beef. It's yeah, like a, it's like thinly sliced roast beef. But <laughs> but I like to mess with it a little bit. Um, anyway, I'm walking along with a friend uh, in Baboa Park, and we stumble upon a large group of people wearing tie dye. And I'm looking at this group, and I'm going, I bet you I know somebody in this group. And my friend, who is very much not a burner, who's with me, goes, why would you think that? Like, why would you think you know somebody out of this group randomly? And I'm like, it's a massive gathering of fabulous weirdos. I bet you I know somebody here. And it turns out to be a wedding. Specifically, the wedding of one Mr. Blake. How do I pronounce his last name? Macca. Macaluso, Macaluso, break Macaluso. Oh, nice. There you go. I actually I had it highlighted in pink because I couldn't remember. Uh, Blake is the business partner of Mr. Dan Reeves. Mr. Dan Reeves, whom you've heard on episodes 123 and 59 of this show, who brought the Journey Project to Burning Man. Dan and Blake own Mid Century Furniture, a burner freaking owned business with lots of great seating and the perfect vibe to record exactly today's episode that's on today's topic. So I totally photobombed their fabulous tie-dye wedding in my gym clothes. Uh, and then we end up back here at the store where the wedding party popped off last night with a taco truck and margaritas and cupcakes. And we had just a really, really great time. And I'm like, holy shit, Dan, I'm supposed to do this episode here. Alignment, synchronicity. <laughs> um, we went up on a stage. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. We're literally on a stage recording right, as we speak right now. <laughs> Um, Dan and Blake supported me on such a massive level when I had my first ever photography exhibition in San Diego a couple of years back. They provided furniture and marketing in their vehicle and they allocate money every year to supporting artists. So the whole thing really is a perfect example of what we are striving for and we'll be talking about on today's episode. So here we are recording today's episode at uh, Mid-Century Furniture, which is on 3795 Park Boulevard, (laughs) San Diego, California. And today's episode is a roundtable discussion, which is a style of episode we haven't done in quite some time. And I am joined by some amazing contributors to the Burning Man community. Today's guests are John Ray, Don Sardinas, 
Francisco Serna and Dan. Well, Dan Reeves is going to pop in from time to time, maybe. Yeah, he, he nudged. Uh, Dawn is on her way over here. She was running behind, and I am absolutely just throwing her on the bus in the intro. Yes. <laughs> She'll be here. Sorry. Things happen in life. It's okay. Um, and I'll have each of these amazing peeps introduce themselves when we get started. But the overlapping connection of the voices that you'll be hearing today is twofold. One, they are all active contributors to the Burning Man community, be it in their service in their local to their local regional Burning Man communities or uh, their elevated level of participation to that thing in the desert. Uh, in short, these motherfuckers have street cred. Uh, and two, they are all business owners who have all generated income and expanded their business through uh, reach, business reach through or in direct conjunction with the burner community in some fashion. The key point here being that these folks are all entrepreneurs who are all actively out there building business and generating dollars. Uh, Like myself, I'm a freelance photographer, self-employed, rather than if I were to work for like a corporation with a salary and have clients who just simply happen to be burners. So we're going to discuss what all that means, of course, in great detail very shortly. Uh, And today we're basically going to opine on what goes how one goes about balancing being a good burner with our default world professional ambitions. How do we show up amazingly in our community and uphold the 10 principles while also stacking our Benjamins all the way up to the ceiling? Uh, I kid, I kid. We're broke, I swear. Uh, One. <laughs> so, so that's the focus of today. I just have a Ben. I don't even have a Benjamin. <laughs> Benjamin. <laughs> so, so that's the focus on today's roundtable. Uh, as always, we'll have our DJ set after the chat. The set you'll be hearing today is from another previous guest. Uh, and just all around supporter and BFF of the whole Burner Podcast team, the irritatingly handsome and talented Dallas, Texas based Kenos, in honor of the ever growing army of yoga instructors who make a majority of their living via the Burning Man community, we'll be hearing a Deep House yoga set, which Kenos played at Camp Mickey Beach back in 2016. You'll hear, you, you've probably heard Kenos' voice on episode 114 of this show entitled Burning Man So White. And you've seen him tower over you at Burning Man 2022. That massive black burner project photo that does absolutely impossible to miss, uh, that was Kenos. So that's after the chat. But let's dive into our commodification conversation. Today's episode is entitled, Synchronicity in Alignment. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, today, today's episode is entitled, A Conversation on Commodification. I go by Mr. Arash, even though nobody calls me Mr. Welcome to Burner Podcast. Set at Utopia at Burning Man, playing that song and seeing what happens. <laughs> Just playing your intro. Yeah, playing my own intro. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good set. <laughs> and I would totally play it in the middle of a, a set that has nothing to do with that kind of music. <laughs> Find out who your true fans are. Yeah, damn right. <laughs> all one of you are out there. Uh, yeah. One, one Benjamin. <laughs> uh, all right, well, let's start with uh, introducing uh, ourselves, those of you that are here. <laughs> <laughs> Frankie, Don, let's... Don, where are you? <laughs> Don, Don will be here shortly. Uh, Frankie, introduce yourself. All right. Um, yeah, so my name is uh, Francisco Cerna, otherwise, I guess, known as Frank. Mm. Um, and uh, I am, uh, I grew up in LA, um, lived in San Diego for several years, and um, have been uh, burning with uh, Camp Universal for, uh, for the last, I don't know, I mean, I'm going to say, 
five, six years because uh, the COVID era, we were still really get, kind of getting together and, and, um, and doing our thing all year long. So um, it's an, uh, a wonderful camp and, uh, and, and fortunately uh, get the opportunity to be a part of a wonderful Los Angeles-based um, community that um, sort of feels like we're um, on the plier all year, all year long. So um, whether we do doing events, getting together, um, for health and, and wellness um, types of uh, types of events, or or just hanging out, it's a um, it's just a wonderful community to be a part of, and so I get to be a part of that community, and now um, have the opportunity to to shape and, and mold a, a business in the in the image of that community, and 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 really try and um, contribute something. So um, that's me. Awesome. Yeah. Right. Tell us about your business. All right, we'll get right <laughs> into it. Yeah, um, yeah. So uh, I have always really loved. Do do the do the two sentence pitch and then we're gonna dive deeper into like the stuff that you do. Got it. Yeah, yeah. got it. Two sentence elevator. Yeah. Okay. Um, I uh, my business is essentially a. Um, I have converted at this point at least. I've, I've I'm working out of the uh, first floor of my home that I've converted um, entirely into a uh, vintage and festival clothing shop mm. slash venue space. So um, I. Uh, currently uh, host events there where I bring people into that space. They can settle in, um, have fun, and um, dance a bit, and um, all the while trying on wonderful vintage clothing from yeah. uh, you know all the different eras. And uh, I focus primarily on unique, fun styles of clothing and really signature pieces um, that people are going to love and, and wear out all the time. And I, 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 I get to see people everywhere on dance floors across, you know, across the events, uh, mm-hmm. wearing stuff that they've gotten from the shop. But um, it's just a wonderful way to bring people together into a space to really settle in to a long form shopping experience mm-hmm. and um, allows for a lot of us to get to know each other in a, in a deeper mm-hmm. way. It's funny. I, I've told people about your business uh, friends in San Diego, and uh, I've had multiple people respond like, that's a very L.A. thing. <laughs> it's, it's my favorite compliment that I get on yeah. a regular basis. It's yeah. like, oh, this is so LA. Yeah, it sounds like a lot yeah. of fun. It's a lot. It's so much fun. It's so much fun, and and it's now getting to the point. It's now getting to the point where um, I'm able to do that on a, a bit on a mobile basis, okay. and and take that same vibe, that same energy to different spots, and and really bring together that same type of experience. And mm-hmm. so um, it's getting to be even more fun. Like in an RV, or how do you make a mobile? Uh, this guy, right, this beast right out here. Oh, okay. Yeah, I just now bought that, um, and uh, figured it was it was it was about time to take the risk, and and got myself a, a Sprinter van that that I can um, take more of the more of the show on the road, and so. Um, we'll talk more about that later in terms yeah. of how that's you know how that's um, working out, but um, but it's just a lot of fun to be able to kind of do that in my space, but um, but also kind of go and and um, and explore different areas with it. So yeah, right. yep, awesome, John. Welcome back to the show. Thank you. Yeah, glad your, to be here. Back to, was this your third time or second time? I want to say third, but I can only really solidly remember the one time at your studio. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I feel like maybe you were part of another roundtable discussion. Yeah, I think that, so. That's how you know you're a professional when you've done enough of a thing that you've lost track of it. <laughs> <laughs> Either that or you just have a really bad memory. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah it's California. We smoke a lot of weed. Uh, <laughs> all right. No, I don't, mom and dad. <laughs> <laughs> but if you could get your mom and dad to listen to podcasts, my mom and dad still have no idea what a podcast is. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> so yeah, tell us, tell us about yourself and your business. Yeah, my name is John Ray, uh, otherwise known as John Ray. Um, <laughs> I started my so many aliases. <laughs> I started my uh, my fine home painting business um, back in 2006 here in San Diego. So we do uh, interiors, exterior painting, uh, cabinetry painting, fine wood refinishing. Uh, we've got 26 people on the team, and uh, we do. Uh, a lot of work, just you know, coastal properties and stuff like that. So that's the that's the elevator pitch. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that, that's yours is a lot easier to understand. That, he <laughs> paints. <laughs> <laughs> and you said uh, you've recently bought another business. Yeah, uh, my buddy John Peak is uh, moving towards retirement, and uh, he had a very similar business to mine here in San Diego. Uh, but we both pull from um, like past referrals and past clients. Um, so when I bought his business, it's not like I really bought a competitor. It's more mm-hmm. like I bought a complementary business to mine. So that doubled the size of my business. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, by combining the two, there's a lot of 
uh, efficiencies that come into play and everything. So um, it's been a challenge. It's been a little bit chaotic uh, merging the two cultures and the two companies together, but it's gone spectacularly well. I have some great mm. people on the team who are really helping me make it all happen. Uh, without all of them, you know, I would be lost. Yeah, so. that's awesome. That's, yeah. that's excellent. Yeah. Yeah. I would imagine, um, God, like just part of the process of like taking over a new team of people who are used uh -huh. to previous leadership, like that alone must be like its own whole adventure. Yeah. Um, you know, John and I have a lot of similarities in the way that we treat our customers and our mm -hmm. clients and our employees and everything. Yeah. So it wasn't too big of a jump for them to, to come over to, to my side, but there was definitely some changes mm -hmm. and we're still going through some things. We're still uh, ironing out some of the wrinkles and making it happen, but uh, it really just comes down to like the attitude and everybody has a great attitude mm -hmm. and um, very positive vibes. We uh, do our regular employee meetings and I'm really focused on making sure that they feel safe and secure mm -hmm. that they don't need to be going out and finding another job or something like that. So, yeah. Yeah. I, and I, my, uh, so my, uh, a, a question that I often ask of guests who are in some kind of business, uh, you know, various levels or in corporate, whatever it is, things in default world. Um, is there an example of something that comes up for you immediately uh, when I ask or, or, or suggest you kind of like opine on something you've picked up and learned through your time navigating the burner community that you translated into your default world business that you had not considered until yeah. this experiences that you had in the burner community. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, my burner experience, uh, is back in 2001 was my first burn. And, uh, I traded a couple utility kilts with my buddy. Uh, the two of us traded utility kilts for tickets, um, and a <laughs> camp spot right on Esplanade at center camp. <laughs> Yeah, so I was like, oh, this is Burning Man. And, yeah. you know, it was just a crazy location to be my first year. Uh, that got me involved in um, the, the, the deep side of, like, the burn and seeing, like, a really established camp and how they operate. And it was totally different than anything I'd ever seen before. Um, and that inspired me. Kind of a long story short is that eventually I uh, got involved in helping with the local burn here, Utopia. And uh, in my leadership in that uh, experience, uh, I learned about delegation and uh, <laughs> you just can't do it all yourself yeah. when you're trying to do, you know, something mm. big and, you know, by putting together and organizing the local, um, San Diego regional burn utopia, um, I found that my role really was just to support the department leads mm. and, build them up and help them as much as I could so that they could be the ones who go out and like really put on the event. Yeah. And so I took that from, you know, the burner world and I brought that into the business world and realized that like, I just need to like not be micromanaging my employees. I need mm -hmm. to support mm -hmm. them and mm -hmm. make, help them make the right decisions when they're out dealing with customers and clients. And yeah. so delegation was a, a big thing that I got from the burning man world that I was able to apply into my business world. Yeah, that's, I got to tell you that that's some variation of that, I think is the most common answer that I've had to that, to that version of that mm. question. Um, because I, I, a lot of folks have described, like the one that pops into my head um, was Rick Wilson, who's the CEO, he was on the episode Truckers on Speed. And um, <laughs> he, I mean, he, a lot, a lot of what we talked about is that when you are in an environment where you you're, you're, nobody's getting paid, right? Like, <laughs> like yeah. you, you have to inspire, uh, uh, people to do things yeah. because it's just not, yeah. you can't threaten to fire them. Um, so you see, you get like a lot better at figuring out how to communicate those kind of things mm -hmm. and spreading the tasks out and all that, all that kind of stuff like that. That is the most common answer that comes up. Yep. And if you're having to threaten people to fire them, <laughs> to get them to do things like you're not really doing it right. Yeah, there's something else wrong. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> what, what comes up for you? Uh, actually, that's uh, it's a great question. I um, honestly, it's it's um, uh, pretty easy. The, the the thing that I think comes up the most. I've always been a big fan of of um, of self expression uh, and, and encouraging self expression. But I think in the radical self expression category of of really kind of taking that to its extreme mm. and giving people a space where not only do they have the tools to sort of express themselves through mm. through fashion, which is, for me, another thing that I've had to make this leap from not being really from the fashion world, um, but primarily sort of more interested in 
sort of identifying and, and, and recognizing and acknowledging people within my community mm. and what, who they are and, and maybe what they're trying to express. And so when I go looking for things, I'm often sort of have that in mind, um, the, 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 the particular personalities within the community and how, how they express themselves. And, and I take notes on those things and it really helps my buying and mm. it helps my sort of what I, what I provide for inventory. And um, I, I think what it's done then is provide this space where people are able to really settle in, take a look through everything that I have and find the things that have that, that, that allow them to express themselves mm-hmm. more freely, more openly, more loudly. Um, and then I give them a space to really kind of create a relationship with either myself or other people that are in that space um, that kind of brings out more of what they want to express. So yeah. I'm able to understand and, and identify what boundaries they might want to be pushing. Mm. And, and as a vehicle to get there, um, it's so, you know, right now, at least I'm using fashion and, and, and clothing and the, the things that we sort of wear and, and, and to, to, um, to really sort of like give them a vehicle for that expression. And so, um, so I think that's been, I mean, I think fixedly something that I've taken from the burn yeah. and from being on the playa and from people having that time where they are radically expressing and then trying to initiate that back in the yeah. default world. The, 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 the kind of business, like the industry you got into was influenced almost directly from, from your experience. Like, how did you end up like in fashion? Like what was directly, it before that? Yeah. It was directly, uh, I think related to that, mm. to that, to that experience, I think because, um, you know, I've always been a, a, a treasure hunter. I've always loved going to, you know, thrift stores and flea markets and mm-hmm. estate sales. And, and um, my first job at 12 years old was working in a swap meet selling clothes, which is interesting to see mm. that come completely full circle That's now. That's so funny. Yeah, mm. setting up clothes for, a, for my dad's friend and, mm. and waking up at three in the morning on a Saturday, mm. every Saturday, and setting up that stand and then talking to people all day as they go through and shop through these clothes. Um, and so very different from the clothes I'm selling now, but there, but it was, it was, um, I've always then from that point on very, very much been a fan of sort of going around and looking for things. I think those things being like right now, at least centered on like fashion is merely it sort of, it was, it was more of like, what do I, what can I store? What can I easily transport? Mm. And, um, I stopped looking for things just specifically for myself when I was out and about. Um, and, and then started to look for things that like I could see people in my community sort of enjoying. Right. And so, um, so I think that, that, that part of it, like, um, becoming a part of a, of a really tight, consistent community, um, that surround that was surrounded the, my burn camp and the people mm. that I knew from, from the burn. Um, I think it grew directly out of that. So I didn't know that I had an eye for fashion or that I had any sort of like ability to be a stylist in a way, Mm. you know, and, um, that talent has emerged from that and it surprised me. Wow. And, and it, and, and, um, it surprised me in the most beautiful of ways because it starts with my, my acknowledgement of the people within my community and it Mm. starts with the people first and then it goes to like what ways in which, what ways are they trying to express themselves? And that then leads now to this idea that like, you know, for me, pri- the primary focus and, and intention of my business is to uh, allow people is to give people that space. And so uh, m- m- much like that's much more of a priority for me than selling anything that I have. Mm-hmm. It's, it's, it's allowing people to have that space and watching them um, sort of uh, uh, enjoy that is has it feeds me. Yeah, and yeah. and I think that 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 like I said that's developed almost entirely from my experience with the burn mm. and and um, and it's it's a way in which I think I can use my skills for um, you know uh, in terms of just relating to people to to really sort of inform those conversations that happen yeah. and inform the ways in which I'm you know providing people with clothing to wear mm. but it's just so much more than that and at least for me it is am I like am I understanding correctly if I if I said that you're almost approaching it like the income is like the 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 afterthought of of the process I would I would certainly like to think so and I think I'm at a point in my life when I can take that risk Mm. Um, I'm not at a point where I'm taking that risk because I'm wealthy (laughs) I'm 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 you know I, I feel like I'm 
I'm deeply in debt via, via this endeavor, and um, and I'm so happy about that. I think that that has been a gift for me. It's it's the motivation that I get up with every morning to mm. to work on this, um, and um, I am doing exactly what I should be doing right now, mm-hmm. and I am constantly aware of that, and and um, and uh, and proud of that, and happy about that. So so it it really drives me and motivates me to continue to keep going, and so. Um, I am, yeah, at a point where because I feel like I know who I am and what I have to give to the community, um, it's allowed me to then formulate a business sort of in that mm. in that vein. Um, and it's allowed me to form it in the image of those things that I think are strengths that I have to provide. And so um, so there's such amazing creative um, you know space with 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 formulating something in that image. and so so I think that yeah, it's it's um, it's a, it's a risk right now for sure, but it's one that I feel like will pay off, and right. the I think the income will come. Right. And I'm not I'm not so I'm not I'm not terribly worried about that. I think that there's a space for this, right. and I think the idea the concept really works. So I'm not worried so much about that happening that coming um, with time. But for now, I'm focusing on building something um, with those with those, um, uh, I guess, factors that I prioritize over that yeah. Yeah. Um, as, the, as the foundational tools that I'm using to build a business. Mm. What I found is that if you focus on those foundational tools and you make sure that you have like a good driving purpose, then the money comes. It does come. If you're focused on the money and that's all that you care about, then it eludes you somehow. Yeah. It's been my experience is that, you know, back when I first started my business, um, you know, I was focused on income and, the, and that's what a business is supposed to be, right? Like there's all these business theories out there, like profit first is a way to do your accounting. And, um, there's this, um, you know, an, an accountability to shareholders that we talk about that yeah. we, mm-hmm. well, we're required to make mm-hmm. profit and, and we rape the, the, the entire environment in order to do it. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's just wrong. <laughs> like we have it backwards. Uh, everything should be about our relationships and our friends and the people around us, our employees, mm-hmm. you know? And if we take good care of all of our community, then uh, that is what ends up producing like a healthy income that can then sustain those activities. But you got to put the priority where it really matters, which is in relationships. And I think that for that that profit priority impacts and affects every one of the conversations that we have and the relationships that we build in our business. And so, yeah. so I, I think it can't help but do so. Mm-hmm. And so, so I think to approach it with a level of not only the reprioritization, but the authenticity behind that, where you legitimately yeah. are doing those things because they're important to you right. and not because they will ultimately generate profit. Right. I think that, that it, it will happen for yeah. sure. But, and it's, it's, I want to ask, I'm going to ask you some more about that, John, because, um, uh, as Frank was describing, um, his like your business is uh, it's exper- it is an experimental business Very right like so. it's not it's not like a traditional business model. Um, I am a photographer for hire, and so it means that I'm I'm an artist, and then like my income also comes from the art, and there's like an overlap there, and I have ways of differentiating what my quote unquote job is versus like when I'm in artist mode, and that's not necessarily something that most people can grasp that are not inside my mind. Mm -hmm. Um, So I'm constantly like trying to navigate, like how does this work? Because as an artist, I I mean, yeah, I'm doing the thing that I would be doing for free. Um, But I'm, you know, generating an income off of it. You, John, being in a more traditional, like it is a traditional service-based business, which is like... Yeah, we're a commodity. Yeah, you hire me, I paint your shit. I (laughs) literally have like 10,000 competitors in San Diego. So like, how do you like... How do you apply uh, this kind of like the more experimental artsy version, the thing that that Frank and I are talking about onto your business? And how would I apply more of what you are doing in your business to my business? Yeah, great question. So um, some examples I can give of how I've applied this into my business is, well, first of all, um, the five principles that we run our business by. Mm. Uh, the first one is safety. Uh, the f- most important thing that we do at the end of the day is go home safely to our families. So that puts an emphasis on the people right there. Uh, the second emphasis or the second principle is the experience that we give our clients. So making sure that our clients who are paying us have a great experience with us, putting their well-being and their safety and their good mm-hmm. ahead of our profit. 
The third is um, to uh, be focused on the quality of the work that we put out. The fourth is to always be chasing improvement. And that is another thing that puts the emphasis back onto my employees and making sure that they're uh, constantly getting better and better in their skills and in their customer service and in their ability to do their job. And then the fifth principle is the one that's based on profit and that's mm -hmm. getting things done efficiently. So I put all of those things in front of the profit, but the profit is still an important part of it, right? Yeah. Of that's like the fifth one. We need to pay five. people's rent. <laughs> yeah. right. And your employees. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that, you know, putting the emphasis in front of everything else first, but then also still recognizing that, of course, the profit has to be there in order to sustain this all, you yeah. know? Uh, but then also... Um, we do a, a we have a, a systematized training program, mm -hmm. um, so we put all of our painters through, um, you know, the very beginning, like how do you open a paint can, all the way to like the very end, like how do you clean out an HVLP system in order to spray properly some mm -hmm. nice cabinets, you know. So we uh, have training to elevate people all the way through, um, and then just the emphasis that we put on the like the customer's experience and all of that. It's all about building relationships, right. not just with like the customers, but most importantly, putting all of my employees first, uh, because when they feel like they're safe and well taken care of and they're happy, then they take good care of our customers. Yeah. And it's just a win-win all around. Yeah. You know, I, I, um, I experimented a few times with, um, for lack of a better description, like sliding scale payment programs. Um, I even like put it out there that like for small business owners in the community, like I'll just book me, like I'll come and like shoot your business. Like you, you can, you can get all the photos you need and then you pay it when you're ready, the amount that you want, like mm. put it completely in other people's hands. And I got zero bites. <laughs> and, uh, I've actually had this interesting experience where I found that like, if people need like some level of like structure of like, tell me what you're worth, like, what am I going to pay you? Yes. Because if you're giving it to them, like without any of that, it's almost like, I don't know if it's like a lack of trust or whatever. It just feels like it's too much. It's too, it's going to be too much brain computing power to figure out yeah. how to do this. So it's like, please just tell me what the hell to pay you. Yes. <laughs> it's a little too yeah. obtuse. It's like, I need to know what to pay. And that kind of informs you on what you're going to get as well. Yeah. yeah. Which it's part of that's part of like the interest that I have on this uh, project that I was uh, mentioning to you um, before we started recording is that I'm I want to get into uh, providing photography services for like nonprofits and charities, um, but I have found that simply going and donating my time, um, one it's a lot of work, <laughs> uh, two um, it doesn't seem to doesn't it it is strangely not as beneficial for the receivers as, as I. Th would think it would be mm. um so i've been kind of experimenting with the idea of like what does it look like if i do the fundraising and you are paying me my full rate mm. not you the, the 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 charity like maybe the money's coming from another direction but then i go there but it's like a hey this person's been hired like this is a, a professional yeah show up this is the day rate uh, yeah. somehow it needs to still be like a coordinated and organized get over here Don yeah. just walked in, but go ahead. Don. No, I. I <laughs> we'll Hello, y'all. We'll introduce you in just a second, okay. but you guys I, chime in on that. No, I think that that's actually it's really interesting um, the way that I've seen that play out in my in the, really the sort of the formation of my business. It's gaining certainly much more structure now as 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 I develop, but mm -hmm. but um, for for some time now I've been working primarily with people within my like identifiable community. Yeah, and so. Um, I, you know, I'm working with something that I'm working with vintage clothing, so often one of a kind pieces that I, that even I can't find another one mm -hmm. of, of what I'm selling. Right. And so they're, they're also, they're incredibly difficult to price. Yeah. Right. So I spent a ton mm -hmm. of time researching, trying to find things like things that have sold that I can kind of like figure out pricing and then finding out what it's finding out what. Um, you know, what things have sold for and, and trying to be even more reasonable than that. Yeah. And so, um, to make things accessible for people in the community. And so, yeah. so as, as I do that, um, the process of doing that, it takes forever, yeah. but it's also then I run into these situations where I'm, I'm pricing something that n people don't have uh, another sort of don't have a category for, mm. right? I mean, when you, uh, when you have a retail shop that deals with new merchandise, there's generally like a manufacturer's suggested retail price, yeah. right? And you can vary slightly from that based on what you need for your store and to operate. 
but I'm dealing with often these one of a kind pieces that may be incredibly valuable, really, in terms of based on their rareness, but um, and and based on their style and their quality. But I also um, I also want to make things like reasonable and accessible yeah. for people, Here, and so yeah. I often don't have that like like uh, I often you know with people, especially within my community, I mm-hmm. don't want to overcharge them. But I also have to reasonably charge them to, in order to, to grow and develop my business. So it's, right. an, it's an interesting sort of you know, uh, conundrum that, that I find myself dealing with all the time. Well, here is an excellent uh, uh, opportunity to compare one community approach to another one. Um, <laughs> so uh, I am Iranian-American, uh, and um, Persian rugs are a thing, <laughs> as, as I'm, I don't need to explain why they're popular. Uh, but... The Persian rug market in San Diego, more or less, from my understanding, it's been a few years, but like my understanding is that it's like the same kind of group of business partners that pretty much own all the Persian rug places. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Like Mm -hmm. I'm sure there's some independent ones, but for the most part, like it's yeah, they they all know each other, (laughs) and they're importing these rugs. And I just uh, and there's this thing in like Iranian culture where like the elder male will just like start opining advice to you and you just have to kind of like smile and shut up and listen to it. So I've been in this situation a few times. And uh, one of these guys who is uh, uh, my my brother's in-laws um, at one point is like walking me off and he's showing me these rugs, right? And he's like trying to like school me on business as, as an elder Iranian. And, um, and he's like, see this rug over here? It's worth, and he's like pointing at one hanging on the wall. He's like, it's worth you know, maybe $500. If I put it for five hundred dollars, nobody will buy it. No one will buy it. Mm. So it's up there for five thousand. Yep. Yep. Yeah, <laughs> yep. And it's that is such an interesting <laughs> principle. That people pay for things yeah. often because they associate the price with the, the status yeah, and true. the status of the of the item. And so, yeah. I but part of the to, can I just mention like part of the reason that I mean he, he that he is selling to complete strangers, right? Mm-hmm. Like he's for the most part, unless they're like. Um, his regular like interior designer clientele or whatever, right? His audience is complete strangers. Our audience in many of our situations, I mean, obviously, John, you have like many clients who are not burners. Like you, and, Frankie, yeah. I would imagine you have less non-burners that come in, but it's going to be more festival more folks. Yeah, you know, it, it's it's branching out into all of you know yeah. into people outside of the community for um, sure. I, I'm I'm I do a lot of photography for government, so definitely a lot of non-burners. <laughs> so like you know how obviously we've got our friends in the community, right? We're going to be like extra protective of like, how do we charge them? Um, how do you navigate that? Right. Cause I found myself in a lot of situations where I'm like, ah, do I, am I giving this person friend price or am I giving them the normal day rate? If they're your friend, they'll pay you full price. Right. <laughs> That's how I look at it. <laughs> if, if they can, if they can, I mean, it's all, yeah. you, just, you don't know, you don't yeah. know where that's coming from. Right. Like, I mean, if, if they can and, I mean, maybe they won't pay you at all because they can't afford it. Right. So, so who, who knows? P- pause this real quick. We're going to introduce Dawn real quick and Please. then we're going to dive deeper into this. Hi. Hi. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you, yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, um, I'm just as a, a real quick intro. Dawn is late uh, because actually, coincidentally, uh, your partner also a, a business owning burner who has done a lot of work for burners in the burner community as well as you know like many many other non-clients mm-hmm. uh you guys switch keys <laughs> yes <laughs> we switch keys for, yeah and you're and you're an hour awesome. away um and give us a like uh you know a kind of short elevator pitch of uh where you are coming from and how that is connected to the their, your business ventures okay so like physically ramona <laughs> yeah um I'm coming from Ramona, and that was my primary business venture for the last five years. In 2015, I started um, sharing you mean Dome Asylum? the Dome Asylum yeah. as a vacation rental. Um, we, our tagline is the hippie homestead. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's really interesting how the burner culture dovetails into that whole thing because it's such a burner household, right? But like... I was trying to be mindful of not using Burning Man to commodify my thing. Mm -hmm. Um, So there's no mention of it anywhere. But like (laughs) so many people have come and stayed with us and they're like, so have you heard of Burning Man? And I'm like, yeah, 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 I have. I like that that one. Um, I remember at one point you said you had 
some potential renters who are checking out your property and they're like, I really like your cactus. <laughs> right. Yeah. So <laughs> like a little, little hippie dog whistle. <laughs> relatively. Yeah. Sure. yeah. Relatively. I think inadvertently cause, yeah. um, we had a little venture where we were selling cactus cuttings mm. off of the property uh, and, you know, for planting. Yeah, yeah. And um, <laughs> <laughs> so the photographer from Airbnb had come through and we had this stacks of mm. cactus and they took a picture of it because it looks yeah. interesting. There's a lot of geometric shapes and, yeah. you know, it's neat. Yeah, we love stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. so <laughs> they took a picture of it, and I was like, yeah, I'm just going to leave that on my listing. Yeah. And, you know, it opened up to hosting a lot more um, retreats because people who know, know. And yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, right. when I... Um, when I, if you I, don't, you just people, think it's a neat picture. Love cacti. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah I've, shot, I've shot a couple of, like, Airbnbs. Like, one of the things that I look for when I'm shooting anything for any, like, commercial venture is I look for ways to, like, incorporate the story. So, for example, Airbnb that was owned by Burner Friends, I made sure to have, like, a photo in there where you could see, like, the stacks of, like, Burner, where, what, when guides sitting mm-hmm. there. So that somebody's flipping through these photos. Part of the story is, like, oh, they're Burners. Right. I'm now more interested in renting this place than I was before I saw that. Mm. Yeah. Which I would be. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, continue. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, so that is the Dome Asylum mm. and that uh, that was my main venture up until actually last year. I kind of officially shut it mm. down. It's still mm. available on Airbnb. The Dome Asylum is going to be reinvented as a private members club. Oh. Cool. FYI. Nice. <laughs> I like that idea. I've been playing around with that idea too, because like, like what is Airbnb? There's definitely some ups and downs happening with the politics behind that. The platform, that. I'm not about it anymore. Mm. Really, like I haven't been. I was really interested. Uh, Hip Camp was a good channel mm, yeah. for mm-hmm. us. Mm-hmm. Um, and and Hip Camp is for listeners who aren't familiar. Hip Camp is. I describe it as Airbnb for your property. Mm-hmm. You can privately camp on, or you can camp on people's private pro- property. Okay. Yeah. So we had several campsites and outdoor spaces, you know, cause as burners, I mean like this is a thing, like we had so much stuff mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I was like, it makes a really great environment. Yeah. Right. And of course you want to share it cause you have all this stuff Yeah. and you can provide this really great space for people to just be and like, you know, not everybody has that kind of space or that stuff. Like we've got, um, you know, fire art and sculptures from utopia and mm. stuff like that. Cause so many of the burner pieces of art end up in storage or not having a place to be appreciated. Yeah. Um, so at some point, uh, I just started thinking about the end life, the end game, the afterlife for all of the art we were making. Mm. So what? Uh, so my partner Wiley and I am just talking to people who don't know me. Yeah, you are. Um, Around the world. Yeah, right. <laughs> so internationally, <laughs> uh, make a lot of art. We started with uh, with fire art, and it's just been getting bigger and bigger until we now have a vehicle, a mutant vehicle. Mm. But I always the pumpkin, the pumpkin project, mm-hmm. which is dope, and yeah, it's it's such a beautiful art car, and it, it is. is it's people gush about it constantly. It's a great combination of left and right hemisphere, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. you know, gearheadness yeah. and fantasy, and it's it's a, it's pretty it's special. Really, really gorgeous. It's a, it is a steampunk 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 pumpkin I mean, yep. stagecoach stagecoach. It is a it is a twist tongue twister yeah, it to is, say it yeah is, it is it's a um, lot of so so there's that and then um you are you still teaching martial arts classes i am okay. so that was actually what i was doing yeah. this morning is i have a uh <laughs> a related business yeah, yeah. <laughs> i just so when i moved to california i moved from new york city and Cal- i moved to california and my, did you know bubble park is bigger than central park i knew that i just found out that recently yeah. and I, they were very proudly <laughs> We, you know? yeah. we all just found out. About yeah, it. yeah. Ta- like I want to say taunting. That's not the right word. Yeah. No, I'm taunting. For yeah. Sure. yeah. You're taunting, <laughs> but the people sure on the news they were just bragging. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, all right, all right, we get it. It's friggin' Central Park's still dope, though. It is true. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not gonna disagree with that. <laughs> you got beef. Yeah. Yeah. I am more likely to get jumped in Central Park than I am. I feel like in Babo Park, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, Maybe. that is probably yeah. true. Yeah. yeah, me personally. Yeah, uh, well, but yeah. I don't know about you personally. But, um, 
So yeah, so the Funkin Project, and I lost my train of thought. What, uh, martial arts. Martial arts. Oh yes, I am still. I have a community class that I teach because um, my previous life I was a martial arts instructor full time. That's what I had. Which I am so including that video on the show notes of this episode. Oh, you should, you should, you should. People uh, like of, that. Really? Of Dawn breaking boards in red high heels. No. Nice. Really? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I want to see that. <laughs> You'll see it in the show notes. Continue. Okay, dope. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, yeah, I have this community class that I've been doing since 2018. Um, and I have a handful of mostly student, mostly children that I teach uh, a couple times a week now. Mm-hmm. So I use the space at the Dome Asylum for that. Um, because it's just nice to have space. Yeah. And Wiley is a welder. Wiley is a welder and fabricator, super yeah. talented. Like master level. Like if you come through the uh, the border mm-hmm. from Mexico to U.S., the Tecate, Tecate border, port of yeah. entry. You go through his gates. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> he built the wall. He built. <laughs> he did actually. It's a small gate. He likes huge contract. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> He likes to say that he built the wall, but yeah. his gate. They also built my front gate yeah. at yes. my house. And he did John Ray's front gate. I had Wiley gates. come out and install it. He uh, took a panel of metal and just cut a beautiful flower out of it. Mm. It was awesome. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's amazing. Well, now, yeah. Now I got to. Yeah. We, we, all, we all have yeah, to do some yeah. sort of work for each other. Um, yeah. Can we do shameless plugs here? Please. Shameless plugs at. Yeah. Do S- that. Yeah. Do S- the shameless plug music. SD it's the shameless plug episode. <laughs> yeah. That's us. Mm. We will Ooh. fabricate your solutions. Yeah. SD as in San Diego or Shop Dog Fabrication mm. Solutions. Yeah. Or that on Instagram and we will the we will link to all of these in the show notes 100%. Right. Um, and uh, and yeah, and before we we got into doing that, we were discussing the topic of what was it right before Don joined us? We were talking about Do you remember? People over money. It sounded like your community marketing to your community. Yeah, is what I yeah, yeah, what yeah. I heard. We were getting us, into that. You asked us, and maybe yeah, since Don's yeah. here now, yeah. it kind of flows that you asked you us go. about that question that you ask mm. many guests. Yeah. How did the burn? Perfect. Um, Let's ask that. Okay, yeah. How did the burn influence how you do business? Hmm. Because they answered that already. Right. Hmm. How did the burn influence how I did business? It. What was something that you, you, I mean, you, after having experienced, not necessarily Burning Man itself, but just generally being active in the community, how it affected the way that you look at business and how you operate? Uh, geez, that's like a question. <laughs> Do they have time to think about it first? Or no. Like, no, they just, they threw, just, they just threw, threw it, it away. It's jumped right in. Yeah. All right, fine. <laughs> Um, I don't have an immediate answer to that. I mean, it, it for sure impacted my life and like it ha- opened up more creative channels for me. Mm-hmm. Um, started getting more interested in expressing myself as like part of my life. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, which, which I mean, that right there could be like really the answer. It's okay. <laughs> and I, I guess I realized that there's less of a separation between work and play. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Um, it's the same. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Brady Mahaney, uh, the, who was my interview subject on the very, very first episode of the show, episode one of Burner Podcast was mm. Brady. And it's funny. I mean, as we're what episode 139 right now, like I, I, I full on forgotten full on episodes. Like I, like I, I'll meet person. And I'll be, like, Oh wow. I didn't even realize that I'd met you. And I, mean, like it, 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 it has happened. It's not a common, but it happens from time to time. But I do remember the interview with Brady because I do specifically remember something he kept describing, which at that time I did not understand because at that time I had been, I'd become active in the community, uh, but I had not been a burning man specifically. And what he kept describing is that Brady has a a postal uh, a post office kind of business where he does like packaging and postal services and things like that, copying yada yada. And he described that what he he interacts with his business as if it's a camp. He's like, oh, you know, you come to our camp, you know, we're gonna take care of you, we're gonna put you in this situation, mm-hmm. yada yada, and then. Um, and then, you know, that's why like, and then at the end you, you charge or whatever, like in, in a default world business, obviously in a camp you're not. <laughs> um, 
But but he kept describing that, and I remember at that time I didn't understand it because at that time I was still looking at the world through the default world lens of I'm going to go do this for work, and then afterwards I'm going to go do stuff that I actually enjoy doing. Yeah, right. Yeah. But mm-hmm. he had, he was describing a similar thing that you're describing, Don, which is like turn that into play. Yeah, and I absolutely. and I didn't get it until I because I recorded that interview right before my first Burning Man. Yeah, mm. and then I went to Burning Man, and then I had the experience. Oh, I get it. Yeah, the whole thing's a game. I could totally yeah. just play this character. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you could get to create it just how you want. Yeah, and um, inside of that, too. Ah, I just lost my train of thought. <laughs> <laughs> Separation between work and play. Yeah. 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 Um, you learn so much out there mm-hmm. and that was just thinking about tying it into a theme camp um, I you know brought my first theme camp to the burn in 2019 mm-hmm. which Arash is part of my camp hey, Seth. Um, and organizing that you know we had done smaller events the regionals and stuff um, but when you're organizing a group of like 40 some odd people to like go out into the middle of the desert and like live mm-hmm. for a week or so and like it takes something and yeah, those yeah. skills translate into default yeah yeah like it's yeah you're learning real stuff mm-hmm. like organizational management stuff boots on the ground stuff like mm-hmm. i help my family put together their shade structure for yeah. the family reunion because nobody knew what to do. And I was like, I got this. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yep. I, yeah. Go ahead. There's something about operating out of, um, you know, kindness for others and, and genuinely caring for them that makes all of those decisions of whether it's going to be for work or for play, that, that all intertwined. Mm. And it makes them much bigger than that moment. Like you're, 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 you're gen- if you're genuinely caring for people, you're yeah. doing so in your personal relationships and you're doing so in your business relationships. And so you can't necessarily separate those um, as easily as I think the world often says that we can. Yeah. And so I've, I've always been, I mean, any, anything I've ever really done and really put myself into career-wise I, has, has sprung from a personal passion of mine. Yeah. And I've always resisted that idea that we, like you said, that we work. And then we and then we play, right? Yeah, yeah. And and we often work in order so that we can play. And we have the weekends, and we do we do those things. But for me, that's that's eight to sometimes twelve hours out of every day that is then spent on doing something other than like realizing those like my passions for people and relationships and 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 the things that I enjoy doing. Right. And so I think to find ways to intermix those and to and to make them really want a part of one another. Um, is is super valuable, and I think that that, that experiences at the burn and and with with that experiment there, where we're living with each other and we're caring for each other so pervasively, um, I think really like if we are, I think as the expectation should be, if we are translating that into our work, into our lives back home, then it becomes a part of everything that we do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I feel like Burning Man is kind of like a little microcosm of the real world, and with the ten principles of Burning Man, it's kind of like a better way uh, in most ways mm-hmm. um, to treat other people in a group. So, you know, there's all these parallels between like work, like there's a lot of work to do at Burning Man. You got to set up camp, you got to build your part, mm-hmm. you got to do whatever. Yeah. But then there's also like the off time and there's like the time that you're able to have the social interactions with those same people that you were just working with. And often that's separated in the real world where you work with some people and then you have your playtime with other people. Right. 100%. But right. when you can bridge those worlds and you end up having the playtime with the people that you work with, you end up with a higher quality relationship, a better work environment. Um, you know, uh, Burning Man is kind of like um, a big slice of reality mm. all compressed into one little week. And you have these principles like decommodification that remove some of the barriers that we have in the in the default world or whatever you want to call yeah. the other 51 weeks of the year um but it's just like uh it's like a little it's an experiment and you get to see what it's like if you were to break down some of those barriers yeah. in the real world yeah so I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, I want to hit like a few very specific topics and kind of like get your opinions on them uh, and as always of course there's no wrong 
Mm -hmm. answer we're just going to kind of see where it goes because uh i think a major part of this is that um i absolutely don't have an answer on any of these things and i don't have a concrete stance on any of them either Mm -hmm. um i am finding that it is an evolving conversation uh we've had camp walter on this show a couple of times uh camp walter for uh, is the big, big giant volkswagen art cars out mm-hmm. of Arizona, their, their camp has multiple massive art cars. Uh, Walter has a major for-profit business. Um, and An entertain- inter- entertainment company. Yeah, yeah. Entertainment yeah, company. They, they, they rent out uh, cars for, um, for events. Uh, they have a massive event space in Phoenix. Um, they are making great money. Camp Walter is also beloved. No one... No one, I, I, I've not heard anybody have beef with Walter about how they do things. Mm. And we've explored this. We've talked about it with them. I'm like, what is it that, you, that we, what is it that they're doing right? <laughs> you know, because I'm going to give another example right now of like one that like pissed a lot of people off, right? Um, uh, best, the best answer we could come up with the last time I had, I, I sat with the crew at Walter in Arizona was if you are giving more to the burn, you're giving more to the community than you're taking people will support it. And that seems to be a general direction it goes in, right? Um, a couple of years back, there was a, a, a famous, very attractive DJ, <laughs> individual or group, I will not clarify which, uh, who had a social media post where like on one image, it was them looking very Burning Man and like, like, oh, it's so beautiful out here and spiritual and yada, yada, right? And then you go to like the next image in the post and it was an ad for electric bikes. <laughs> and oh. so, yeah. So, that, yes, that's the reaction that a lot of people had. Um, so, I mean, like the, the level of like hate that came under that post would like went just ape shit. Yeah. Um, and that probably just sold more electric bikes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm curious. That's like, what happened this year. Yeah. That's why all the electric bikes. There are so many electric bikes. There are so bikes. many yeah. fucking electric this bikes. Was, yeah. This Slow was like, down on your electric bike. Yeah. I'm saying it now. <laughs> Get off my lawn. Yeah. Yeah. For yeah. sure. This was, yeah, this was like five-ish years ago. But like earlier in the conversation, I was describing that a part of like, for example, as a photographer, what I would do is I might, if I'm shooting somebody's Airbnb, I might include in my set that I'm turning into the Airbnb owner, photos of like their Burning Man art, right? It's up to them whether or not they want to use it. I guess, but that that doesn't seem to be like terribly upsetting. But again, of course, like I'm not in front of like 50,000 people the way that this DJ is. Mm-hmm. But the, but that's some of the question. Like I want I wanted to see like what thoughts come up for yeah. all three of you about this topic. What what is something somebody could be doing wrong, quote unquote, versus right? Like, what is what? What are just some thoughts that come up? There's, I think it's nuts. very circum like environmental is the right word, um, because if you're you're not using that place, that event, but we're burners, we have a culture that exists outside of that event. Mm-hmm. It's recognizable; people know. So, and I mean, and you can market yourself as burner friendly or two burners without actually ever having said that. (laughs) Yeah. You know, like legit. Yeah. If you have to say it, maybe. (laughs) Right? Yeah. Yeah. It's like, that's how I have always kind of taken it. It's like, I'm not going to use what I bring or what I do on Playa to market my shit in default. Mm. But it is influencing it, obviously. Like, how could it not? Yeah, mm-hmm. like how could it not? Yeah. So, but I'm not using that to market it. It's just cool, mm-hmm. and people like it, and it's not doesn't exist anywhere else because Burning Man art yeah. doesn't exist yeah. other places, right? You know, and mm-hmm. it just kind of filters it out on its own, like that way. So it doesn't. I feel like if you're you. L- there's like a using it. Mm. That's the thing. Yeah. Are you influenced yeah. by it or using it? Yes. Uh, All right. There's like a threshold I think that you cross when you start to be using it rather than just being a part of it. Mm. And if you're 
a DJ putting a picture of yourself at the burn and then the very next thing you're showing is like an electric bike ad. That feels a little bit more like you're using it yeah. versus if you're just a part of the community. I mean, I've painted probably homes for a hundred burners around San Diego, mm. but I'm not like putting up like pictures that show me at Burning Man and be like, I can paint your house. <laughs> you know? yeah. 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 Right. I have dust resistant paint. <laughs> right. Everything will be tan. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think it's a really interesting approach uh, to, to think about it in that term. Like, are you using it or is it, is it a part of you? And if it's like a part of you and if you're a part of it, it's not necessarily, um, it feels different. And that's a function of how much we internalize the experiences and the, and the lessons that we're learning from that place and from mm-hmm. that event and from our community and from the community that's, that, that kind of uses that as a central sort of focus point yeah. um, is that is that ultimately it it um, it does it influences tremendously mm. and it influences tremendously. But I, I think that also like I have I have used it zero percent like zero times in my marketing. My my business is called Outfits and Oddities. It has yeah. nothing you know no uh, direct relationship with it. Um, it's it's in ze- it's in none of my you know marketing posts. Yours is a wider so it's a much wider spectrum, right? Because like it's festival culture. Yes. And festival culture has an overlap with burner culture. Yes. But it's it's a lot wider. Like not all people who go to festivals know each other. Yeah. Right? Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> well, and 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 even bigger than that is I think that it uh, and I think that I think for many of us it is important that um, the things that we do that are influenced by the burn and influenced by our experiences within that community mm. um, don't just stay with that community. Yeah. That otherwise it's not it's, it's not as valuable to the world. Um, our experiences there aren't contributing as much with the, with the, with the things that are around us. If I mean we can't be out there 52 weeks out of the year. That experiment probably doesn't work for that long. Yeah. And so we're we're in the world. Um, um, interacting with it and, and living in a capitalistic culture and all of these kinds of things. I don't think it's all meant to. The time. And I don't yeah. think it is either. But I don't think I, it's meant to. I think it's meant to be an extreme contrast so that you come back and with, yes. a, with, a, with a middle way. Yeah. But I do think that we are meant to influence mm-hmm. the, the world in ways I think that are, that are directly related to those experiences. And I yeah. think that we can do that. And, and I feel like that's, um, that's such an exciting challenge, an exciting process of trying to figure out how am I going to bring this into the world, not utilizing the brand right. of, of, of Burning Man, but, but instead, mm-hmm. instead utilizing the, the, the principles and the experiences and the community that we have. I mean, my reach is going to be far broader broader than the burner community yeah, and, yeah. and 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 I want to I want to celebrate that because I'm 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 now presenting you know what I'm the the the, the place for self-expressing that for self-expression that I'm providing for the burn community mm. I could easily pr- be providing for people outside of that community and they need it yeah. and so so I think that that's that's super fun I'm excited for that can I give you an interesting example of that uh you know, because like obviously we're talking about money here, and like one of the driving forces behind this conversation, and uh, not just this podcast, just this conversation in general in the community, is that the topic of money is often very triggering for mm-hmm. people, um, whether you're creative or not. <laughs> you know, like the 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 concept of money, like uh, we've all been privy to at some point a conversation somewhere where people are like, oh, this person is just trying to make money off blah blah blah, or like, how dare you want to make money? You know, this this is a thing that comes up. Um, is it the money specifically or is it like the stories connected to that? And, in, mm. and the one specific example that comes up for me, uh, is that I, I never post this show in like the Burning Man Facebook group. I'm not really on Facebook anymore mm. these days, but like I tried it once earlier on and like there was a, a bunch of shit talking. Uh, like, that page is awful. Oh yeah, it is awful. <laughs> yeah. It is. It is. It is. But it's it so is. much fun, but like, yeah, don't no, go there for it's like awesome. it, is, it is not, it is, I always tell Any people, it sort is of validation not, now. Right. It is not a, it is not a valid, um, uh, uh, a snapshot of the burner community. No. no. It is an extreme snarky approach. I see, see people <laughs> yeah. just get yeah. fucking real. Uh, yeah, like, no, it's oh, hilarious. Oh man, these poor, it is, doe-eyed uh, virgins. It is so still, sad. you know what it is though? It is the most, it is a more extreme, Extreme uh, test market, if you will, of right. how a conversation can go. It, yeah, <laughs> right? it can. Yeah, for sure. And I, and I like that. And I like that as an experiment. I like hearing from the people that 
are the most burnier than thou from like even like my own social circles because I'm like if I can win them over I can win anybody over right like that that is a part of the process good. but I did I had posted in there early on and there was this response of like you're promoting your podcast right which mm-hmm. is like not at all how I see this thing um, and it's just never promote I've never, and I've had other guests posted in there and they've had similar responses mm. I don't make any fucking money off of this thing yeah, this thing has cost me nothing but money right. <laughs> my whole life. the whole time I've been doing it this is not no one's making money. money so like what <laughs> that promotion leads nowhere yeah, financially yeah. you need yeah. to work with an electric it's bike like, company I'm sorry you need to work with an electric I bike company I should I need to sell electric bikes okay. yeah. modify you know, this shit another <laughs> example that pops up in my mind is that uh uh, a couple every once in a while, I feel like this is a thing that happens where like some fashion designer will all of a sudden get a shitstorm from mm. from the from the community. Well, uh, but the, like sometimes that shit is ridiculous. Yeah, there was some outfit that was made up of images of, of the temple the art. Yeah, yeah, not yeah, just yeah. The te- like other that. art yeah. pieces, huh. and they used it as like that was the fabric, and then they like made an outfit oh, out really? of it. Yeah, yeah. yeah, it was bananas. So I was like, thing. no, that's some bullshit. Bro. I do not know this. <laughs> that's so wrong. I, I have a I vague agree. memory of this particular uh, artist, um, and I remember doing a little bit of a deep dive on it, and this is all not going to be like correct necessarily, but I do remember having some of my deep dives, I would look at these and go, oh, okay, like they're not actually selling this piece. This was an artistic exploration. This person has been a burner for like 15 years, you know, like 20 years. Like they're really, really into it. This is their thing. But then just something snap in front of, in like social media and it went nuts. And then it gets more people to look at that and go, oh no, I can't make, I can't be like a business person or, you know, or have my own venture in the community. Again, I don't have an answer for this. Uh, It's just an exploration. Mm -hmm. What, What are some thoughts that come up? So my first thing is you can't count on the community to pay your bills. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. Right? Ow. Ain't in their job. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then it would feel like you're using the community, right? Yeah, yeah. So if you've got something that's dope and you know, you have to be able to broaden your market. Yeah. Right. Otherwise, like if you're just count. So I had this experience. OK, mm, hit me <laughs> when I first came <laughs> to San Diego and like, you know, there's a lot of socializing and house parties and da da da. And so I thought, like, maybe I'm going to throw give this a shot. Right. Mm. Like throw some parties and try to make some money. Um, but you know, like everyone's got a homie Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. and then like, yeah. you know, it, it, now it doesn't work that way. Yeah. You can't count on like, uh, yeah, I can have a, an event mm. and throw an event and charge a cover at the door well, and make some money. Um, but not inside of our community Yeah, because then it's like your friends and who's going to pay. And you know, on one hand, like, like John Ray said, if they're really mm. a friend, they will pay. Yeah. But I feel like it's true. There are people who count on the community to like support their businesses and that's the only thing they got going. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like if it's only via if you can only get your friends to buy your stuff, then maybe it's not a really good business idea. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Harsh realities. Yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. Thrown down by dawn. <laughs> <laughs> it's yeah, true, it's, it's so funny. It's like I feel this like emotional need to like defend it, def- but it's so, <laughs> she's, you're right. You like, back on if that? your product yeah. is only valuable to people who like you, well, it's, it's actually like one of the reasons I don't, I'm not on social media much anymore because I was looking at like all the, you know, I was like, oh, it's great that people like my photos when I post them, but this is not. <laughs> it doesn't do anything for you, yeah, does it? Those are my friends. They yeah. like me. Yeah, yeah, of they course. Like me. Yeah, they like yeah. you. Yeah, they're like whatever you put up there yeah yeah yeah, yeah. The, the selfies get more likes than my actual photos i'm right? like do i just suck one of my most popular <laughs> posts is like me with a giant rum and coke and i think all that is so true and i think that that's why i'm really excited about mm. like branching outside of that and 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 working outside of that to a certain extent i mean i i will always um, want to work with people within my community and, yeah. and provide uh, events and spaces for them to 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 have fun and express themselves and 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 meet people at a, at a deeper level, but to want to do that outside of that community, I think is really important. I think yeah. that 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 we have a um, we have a gift to share, and I don't think my intention is to um, to recruit people to go to the burn. 
Like that's not yeah. my right to recruit people to like to become fixedly a part of that community. My intent is to. Yeah. In is fact, to don't share. go. Yeah. In fact, please don't. Please don't <laughs> go. If you're listening. Um, but but all my 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 intent primarily is to share things about that lifestyle and about that community and about those principles that mm-hmm. I think will help to shape people's lives outside of that community. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I want to know, um, John. Uh, as as the most traditional business owner in a group here, can you share a little bit about uh, how you go about like marketing your business, and if you if there is any conversation that you have with yourself or, or your team about how you go about marketing, uh, does is does the community or not the community even come up in that conversation? Um, yeah, great question. Um, so the majority of our business comes from past clients and referrals from mm-hmm. those past clients. So it's like you have like your own community within the community you've built. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, um, you know, we do some paid marketing and stuff. Uh, we do some Google AdWords and we're on a, uh, we do a search engine optimization. And so, you know, it's probably about 90% of our business comes from outside of the Burning Man community. But that means that 10% of our business is coming from the burner community, which is pretty significant. You yeah. Know? yeah. Um, so, uh, as far as marketing goes, like the the burner community is awesome, and we get a lot of uh, jobs from people who see like my social media posts or just know me or friends who we've painted for who tell them. And so, by being a part of this big burner community, it's certainly been like a boon to mm-hmm. us. But uh, you know, like Don was saying, like we don't rely on it. You know, it's not mm-hmm. if I if. Um, if I said something to offend the Burning Man community and I was exiled, like we would be okay, you know, we'd still be making it. <laughs> would you like to say that thing now? I was thinking the other way. I was like, I only paint burner households. I'm sorry, I can't help you. <laughs> sorry, my paint doesn't stick to normal walls. You know, <laughs> go to the burn, then we'll talk. We only use rainbow colors. So this <laughs> But I think, you know, uh, both of these guys have talked about how, you know, talking about Black Rock City is an experiment and decommodification is a principle and it allows us to have a certain kind of experiment. Um, But it's just that incubator and it's freaking amazing and I love Black Rock City. Mm. But I think it is on us to take what we learn there, take the things that we're getting from it and bring it back out into default. I think mm-hmm. that is our mission. Yeah. yeah. And I've had, because of the nature of the Dome Asylum, um, really amazing experiences with people. Like some people get all the like little cues I have in the listing yeah. and mm-hmm. they come ready for that. Yeah. And then like some people are really taken aback and I can tell like even with our, uh, you know, polite society version mm. of what we got going on at the dome. <laughs> I'm pushing edges for them. I'm pushing boundaries mm-hmm. yeah. and they are just like, mm, yeah. you know, um, and I've had people express to me like how they feel there. And, you know, I've thought about like trying to like rewrite the principles as like the house rules. Like, you yeah. know, those in this house we practice. Yeah. 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 Yeah, in but this house we don't sell to each other. Exactly, I got stuck at decommodification because, like, no, pay me. <laughs> I got stuck there. <laughs> we have nine principles in this house. Yeah, we have uh, nine principles. Oh no, I can take um, that was, that consent. Was, well, we can still have t- ten. Yeah, that's yeah. an interesting yeah. point. <laughs> that's an interesting, an interesting point that you bring up about decommodification because, like, you know, at the event of Burning Man, it's decommodified, right? Yeah, but it took us but so how much, much money. money do you spend to get? there yeah. I mean, how much gasoline are you burning to go hang out with a bunch it's of like eco-friendly event. hippies you know and yeah. so there's these like interesting dichotomies of so much commodification that's required to get there but once you're there then it's this Hello, like Home sacred Depot space and walmart yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. come on now <laughs> yeah. and no, what's and awesome I'm- is that when you remove that decommodification um uh, dynamic from society for one week when you're all out there together that's when walls are broken down and that's when you like can relate to that person um, who's helping you with something. And when you go and you help somebody else with something, 
it just makes you feel a deeper connectedness of humanity versus this transactional relationship that we experience so much yeah. in the real world. You're not paying someone to do something for you. Ab- yeah. Right. Absolutely. I think that is a, that is a, a very pertinent point, that tra- the transactional element of that, because I think that like, you know, I'm not ready to completely sort of flesh out and, and, and define what to be decommodification really means. Right. And, mm-hmm. and, and how that means in its strictest sense or in like, I don't want to even take it too loosely for my own gain or for my own purposes, mm-hmm. but, but I want to, but I think that there's some spirit that that is sort of pointing us to that I think re- relates to how we work with customers and how we work with others and, and the transactional element of how people often approach people in business, I think is, is something that we can influence. It's, it's yeah. some, something that we can turn on its head and really practice decommodification in that sense of like the transaction itself mm. is not my primary agenda here. And yeah. It's not my primary goal for this relationship, for this mm. conversation, totally. and even for the selling of this product. And right. so, so I think that that's something that we really have an opportunity to influence. Yeah. Yep. No, that, that's, that's so spot on. Uh, and, and really the, what it comes down to is your, is is the only reason I am even human to you mm-hmm. <laughs> that I am mm-hmm. I am the end result of a transactionally focused in uh, 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 interaction? If that's that's where that's where it is, like that's the, that is what we're experimenting with moving away from and doing our best and exploring and having a conversation about. It's not to say that you're not allowed to make money. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely yeah. not. But even businesses have or should have um, their core values, right? Right. right? And so as burners, our core values are going to be similar. Yeah. 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 The, mm-hmm. I mean, I'm just going to read exactly mm-hmm. just since we're on the topic. Decommodification, this episode is not specifically about decommodification and the burn, the burn, burning man itself. But in order to preserve the spirit of gifting, our community seeks to create social environments that are unmedi- unme- unmedita- unmeditated. Can't say unmediated. That unmediated. Unmeditated, Jesus. <laughs> you got moron. Hit me. Uh, by, by commercial sponsorships, transactions, or advertising. You're not a moron. Very yeah. smart people say moronic things. Every once yes. You're yes. not a moron. Yes. Right. Not yes. at all moronic. Admit it was a moronic but, thing. You know. <laughs> uh, the, just for the record, the gin that's left over from the wedding last night is pretty good. Um, <laughs> it is... It is <laughs> We stand ready to protect our culture from such exploitation. We resist the substitution of consumption for participatory experience. So, I mean, really, a big it's chunk about of that. consuming. That's right. what you don't want to. It's the, the consuming trans- culture. It's the mm-hmm. idea of like staying away from like the you know like uh, Budweiser coming in and taking over half of Burning Man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 You know, and when people paying Burning, Burning Man. Yeah, like oh, well, I'm those- paying, so I should get this. No, yeah. you don't get yeah. nothing. Right. Yeah. You get in. Because I guess what you get. here's actually a, a topic that at some point I'm eager to have an episode about is um, uh, branding. Because I can tell you that uh, at Burning Man, like on Playa, at regional events, there's a master class of branding happening, which mm-hmm. is like a part of the de- like commodification culture, having a strong brand. But there are a lot of camps that have like strong brands. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like it is a strong brand. I want to wear a t-shirt of that camp even though I don't camp with them. Uh, I'm going to pay to go to their events even though I don't give a fuck about trying to fundraise for them. Like yeah. it is sure. a part of the thing that exists out there. So that's kind of a meta mind fuck. <laughs> yeah. No, absolutely. And, yeah, and I yeah. think that like, um, like coincidentally or, or maybe ironically, I don't know which word best mm-hmm. applies, but, but I feel like that my the, the, the growth and development um which is minimal so far but i think i, I see great things ahead um for for my business i think puts me in a much better position to to um to practice gifting mm. i think that i had a conversation with somebody last night that that we're talking with about about um i'm doing a bunch of events with and and, and all of that that we talked about sort of getting back to our ch- the charitable roots of my idealistic 20s Mm. Um, where I was, I was spending like, t- you know, time and, and effort and, and, and with, with communities that I wanted to serve. And I'm putting myself, I'm trying to put myself in a position where I can free myself up to do that. Right. And I think that that's part, that's part of my agenda. It's one of my goals. And so I think that, that they, the, the gifting that comes out of that, the ability to do so, I think is something that I'm really excited about. And I think my business is hopefully going to be in, put me in a better position to practice that or even some of the other, you know, principles in, in more depth. 
mm-hmm. um, uh, while, while still exploring and not justifying my, my you know, within the decommon, decommon, decommonification car- uh, car- uh, category, you know, yeah, so, yeah. so I, I, I um, yeah, I'm just, I'm, I'm excited that that might be a part of it. Right. Let's say this. You each have a new employee, a doughy-eyed, excited, starstruck young go-getter who's like ready to go to work for your for your business, for your brand, whatever. Uh, this person has no understanding of Burning Man whatsoever. They don't get it at all. Um, what is the most immediate, the highest priority thing that you want to communicate to them? them coming into work for you, them having an experience, let's say, I don't know, let's go extreme. Let's say they've been working in the financial sector Hmm. and that's their only experience with money making, um, with work. It's just all been in that world, but now they're here, they're ready to work for you. Uh, You are a burner, you own a business. How do you communicate what your highest, most important priority is to this person? Well, we don't have too many finance guys who want to become house painters. <laughs> but uh, let's say I get let's, where you're going with that. Yeah, so. yeah. They had a DMT trip and something changed, and they're like, "I need to go paint houses." I mean, you know, like painting houses is actually very enjoyable. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's you meditative. Work with your hands, it's yeah. meditative. Yeah. yeah, you get a lot of satisfaction at mm-hmm. the end of the day. But um, you know, uh, to your question, like I think that one of the most important things to me or the way that I communicate with them that we're different, we're not just all about money, is that we put the focus on to the experience that the client has and the quality of our work. And, um, you know, I mentioned in my the five principles of my company earlier, you know, making money is important, but that's the fifth principle. It's not yeah. the first or any of the first four. So, you know, that's the that's what I stress with all of my new employees is that you know, after safety, the most important thing to us is the customer has a great experience. And then they see also that we have a culture in my company of, um, you know, professional uh, uh, learning new skills and, you know, making ourselves better and all that. And so, you know, it's that it's the relationships. And to mm-hmm. me, it's all it's all about building each other up, um, holding each other to high standards um, and, um, you know, being a community amongst ourselves, you know, our own little company community, uh, rather than just being all about profit. Let me fine tune the question. Let me say, what would you do? Everything I described, same thing. Excited, comes from finance background, your new employee. This person is now your marketing manager. (laughs) (laughs) How do you, how do you give direction to this person? And by the way, it's okay if they don't get it. Like it's not, in this thought experiment, we're not assuming that they're going to understand, but you're going to do your best to communicate with them. What would you say? <laughs> I think it would be the same. Like, um, I don't know yeah, what you I, said yeah, you had the five values, now. and like, these are the values, these are the things that we're promoting and, and leading with. Yeah. Right. Um, but you have a closed market here. Let's let's blow up this market. Let's make as much money as we can off of this this local community. You got to focus on the ones. Oh, uh, so you like as someone who's trying to like persuade you to, yeah. to go into that because that is a thing that happens. So, so I I feel I'm trying to think of. I feel like I've had this experience. This exact people, conversation. Yeah, <laughs> people are like, but why don't you just sell it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm just like, I can tell you, I regularly have it with family and friends who are and not. I'm burners. like, because that's not really why I did it. No. Like, yeah. Like, you know, like there are things that I did to sell, mm-hmm. and then there are things I didn't. Yeah. You know, um, I did have an, you know, a commodifying end game in mind with mm-hmm. the pumpkin project. Right. You know, because. I mean, and vehicles take a lot of time and money. Yeah. And, you know, as much as I love business and stuff, I ain't rolling in it like that just yet. So, yeah. um, you know, I had to have some end game. Like, I can't just, I can't just art for art's sake all the time. Yeah. You know, sometimes you can. No, there's there's a, there's a pretty big culture of art cars making money. Mm-hmm. Burning Man. Right, That's, that's yeah. already a thing. Yeah. I still feel guilt. I haven't actually even. Uh, so here's where I'm at. I haven't pulled the trigger on it because I'm still feeling so gun shy about. Mm-hmm. Hey, my art car's for rent. Hey, my art car's for rent. I'm saying into the mic. That's you, listener. <laughs> <laughs> Shameless plug. So, uh, about your question, I have a metaphor that I could use for that. Uh, uh, okay, so um, if somebody is drowning, 
they're pushing down everybody around them mm. to lift their head a little bit higher. And that's what like a lot of these greedy profit based companies are doing is they push down everybody around them so they can get a little bit head above water. Whereas the, if you take a different perspective on the same kind of visual, the rising tide lifts all boats. I love that. So yeah. if you yes. support the yes. people around you and you get all of them to do better, then you'll also, as a result, Absolutely. do better. Yeah. And that's Absolutely. just a better way to we, go. We can all. John yeah. Ray is such a great leader. Damn great. right. <laughs> that's, Thank you. <laughs> that's, that's a really good answer. I, I, I think that for me, the, the, not to stay too on topic, but to explore another one of the principles and how I think it relates to um, the way that I want to do business and the way that I would want for my employee or marketing director to, to, um, to be the f- forward face of, the, of, the, of, of, of what we're doing is that um, there's, a, there's a certain immediacy in the way that I've structured the, the, the way that we're working with people. We bring right. people in for events or we're at places where there could be a more long form shopping experience. You know, when you walk into a store, Nordstrom, someplace on, you know, someplace on Melrose, whatever, you're, you feel like there's an unofficial sort of time limit for you being there. Mm. Um, and, and, and if you're there for two hours, it's probably going to get a little weird, right? Yeah. Either for yeah. you or for the people working there. Um, and, it gets and, worse in your, some European cities I've been to, by the way. Yeah, no, of course. And Why are you here? Why aren't you buying? Yes, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I've tried to create something that that's not an issue. Um, settling into that environment and staying for a while is something that's almost expected. And, and so what that allows for is it allows for a certain level of sort of immediacy with, the, with those relationships. And when mm-hmm. I'm talking to somebody, I don't feel like this has to be expedited. And I would want for someone who was working for me or with me to understand that as a principle, mm-hmm. that, that the reality is that, you know, a, a lot of what I'm trying to do is take some of the corporate um, taglines and actually make them true. And when people say things like people over profits and you know, all of those kinds of things, they're saying it as a means to a financial end yeah. that they're saying it because, right. because displaying themselves to be that way makes people feel more comfortable doing business with them. And, 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 and it, it's, yeah. it's, it, there's ultimately profit in that. And it's I think inauthentic it's and it's inauthentic though. And I think that authenticity is, yeah. is super valuable and it's the most important thing to me right now. And so I think that, that to, to really take that and mean it and people over profit. So I would want someone who's working with me to really explore that. Yeah. To, like if they're talking yeah. to somebody and there's, there's, there's the, the, I often tell people like we are, at least in this initial phase, we're probably going to leave a lot of money on the table. Mm. Like we're probably going to, if we're going to do this right a certain way, we're probably going to resist certain temptations and certain opportunities that might come our way. Um, you know, I, like you said earlier, my, it's so LA, like when I, <laughs> I can easily yeah, go yeah, to yeah. one of these Instagram influencers yeah, that yeah. look up secret things in LA yeah, to yeah. do. Oh yeah. And you know, walking mm, into yeah. my place is like walking into a Narnia of vintage clothing that yeah. everybody would be excited to excited for. And yet nobody knows about it. Mm-hmm. Right. And so I could easily get people to know about it through go, by going through one of them. But I don't know if I want that. I know, in fact, I know that I don't. Yeah. And so, so I think that there's, you know, right now I'm going to leave that on the table and, and I'm going to build something that ultimately those people, I hope, will find out about, right? I'm not resistant to profit, mm-hmm. but I'm also not going to put that as a priority. I want to make it so that, that the, I can manage the number of people that are there during an event. I could talk to every single one of them. You're preserving the ha- experience. Mm-hmm, I could provide that experience. And there's an experience that goes along with yeah. the purchase of that piece of clothing or yeah. not purchasing at all. Yeah. And, and, it, and it's, I want to add to that because, um, uh, you know, with our circle of friends, we absolutely have a network of like influencers we could like immediately flood onto your business and it's in LA like yeah. it, it, could, it could totally blow up but the the emotional infrastructure is not there mm-hmm. right like and, and it collapses on itself if it like blows up too fast mm-hmm. yeah um, and it's it's and it's like I guess that's a part of like the the experience that we're having in this generation having this community is that I'm like I know I can make the fast money thing but like I don't want to because I don't want to hate myself <laughs> yep, <laughs> like in yeah. a couple of years and that that is absolutely a thing that happens absolutely um, I want to flip the question that I asked at the beginning of the show around so now that we've gone through this whole journey now that we've like established our time in the Burning Man community you've been in multiple burns and camps and you've led things you've been involved now 
now that you are in a position of leadership in the Burning Man community, what do you bring out of your business experience and apply it into how you can contribute to the community doing better and being a better, being more successful? Uh, so, I mean, all of the the planning, budget, um, project management, it, that's really it. Like budgeting stuff, fund rate, like it's all... Uh, it's it's all business, but like so, I had this epiphany at one point a while back. Like, running a business is not so much different than running a household. Yeah. Like, you got rent to pay. There's utilities. You got to get money coming in from somewhere. You got money coming. You know, so there's those aspects of anything. So there's money coming in. There's money going out, mm-hmm. and there's a timeline. You know, like what are your goals? You know, so I feel like that kind of stuff breaking down the group's goals into a plan and figuring out a budget for it and yeah. stuff like that yeah can i i mean i that's just i just want to share this for fun um i i recently made the connection that uh budgeting for my calories <laughs> is the same as budgeting my time for the coming week <laughs> I can eat, I can do this thing or I can do this thing, but I can't do all of it in the same day. <laughs> so it applies. Mm. What you guys got? Yeah. I mean, that's where my mind went to is like the organizational side of things. Like I've can, written, I'm sorry to chime in real quick. You, you've, I mean, you've led utopia. Yeah. Uh, you've produced it. Was it one year or two years? Uh, four years as producer and I was uh, president of the board, you know, for like three years. Right. And, so you're three years earlier, was it was, was, the, was the three years a few years ago and then you came back? Uh, so yeah, 2011 and 12 is when I was producer and right. then president of the board for like 12, 13, 14, right, and then right, producer right. again for 16 and 17. Okay. And that's just, I just want to, uh, and you can go back to listen to John's episode of this podcast, but like I've worked under John both actually in a, in a burn uh, capacity as well as a, 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 yeah. a business capacity. Yeah. You did a I've, bunch I've, of photography. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. yeah. And I missed two appointments. <laughs> John, John. Which so, is why we don't work together. Yeah. No, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but I remember like even, you know, working with you at Utopia and Utopia is like, a, it's one of the more major regionals in the world. Uh, it's, it's a much more, it's a more elaborate machine. Um, and yeah, watching you in that leadership role, I just think it's important for listeners to have like a frame of reference. It's very interesting to me, uh, to observe that as like a storyteller, like you're just like, you're calm, not a whole lot trips you out. The the radio is like screaming things. And I'm just like, listen, I'm just like watching you. You're just like, like <laughs> straight. Uh, and you're like, yeah, when they need me, they'll tell me. And, and like, I think like just to like navigate things like that, uh, in, in this kind of like volunteer culture, I just want to shout that out is like something I've always like admired and respected about you as a leader. Mm, so, thank you. So, so props to that. So having that frame of reference for listeners who are not going to go back and listen to that episode, uh, <laughs> what, um, what would you say you could take back to that experience from your business world? Yeah. So there, there's a lot to unpack there, but um, <laughs> yeah. So like from the business world, like I've written many business plans and it starts with that. You have to have an end goal and know where you're going. And I think that a lot of times in sort of the uh, artsy burning world, we don't have a lot of that same um, architecture and infrastructure and planning and project management and, you know, all of the kind of like, not so fabulous side of putting together a big event like utopia is uh so uh i brought that with me i think from the business world into the festival world um and just that sense of organization and everything but then also you know it's just like uh it's 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 a feedback loop it goes both ways where uh when in regards to uh the people thing so like by um, empowering and enabling and building up and making people feel confident in themselves that they can hold and do this whole department of utopia. Mm. Um, that makes them feel like they can. And yeah. then when they go and do it, um, you don't want to like be like a helicopter parent, like yeah. making sure they're doing it right and checking <laughs> in and micromanaging and, Oh, you should do it. That like, you know, you let people do it. And, uh, and then sometimes they've, 
fall down. And when they fall down, then they'll ask you for help and then you go help them, you know, but uh, you can't, you can't micromanage. You can't like, you know, expect that like an event like Utopia is just going to all be able to get done by like you Mm -hmm. and your knowledge. You have to um, trust and empower the people who are managing Mm -hmm. all the different slices of that whole Utopia pie. So yeah, yeah, that's a lot of what I brought back is um, just the the people piece of it and building up those relationships so that people do feel comfortable that if they do fall down, they're not going to be embarrassed to tell me or they're not going to be afraid to tell me, but they're going to feel like, oh, I better go tell John that this happened because he'll help me fix it. Hmm. You know, that kind of a culture versus uh, being afraid to tell me. That's massive. Mm -hmm. Like, I want to really like highlight that because uh, I've been in a lot of leadership positions, mostly in like art project sprint situations. And one of the things that I try to foster is um, I will purposely send you, you know, stupid cat photos <laughs> because like <laughs> I want us to just be in a playful communicative stance. Like I want to just enjoy talking to you and what I, I cause I've, I would hate, I've had this experience and I would hate if you're receiving a text or a call from me to think, Oh no, what's wrong? Like I want, I want like to be like, oh cool. Like you want to be like looking forward to this communication. Yeah. Um, and if the answer to something is no, like I can, I didn't do this or I can't do it. I just want people to be like, it's okay. I just need to know that as soon as possible so we can make a decision of what we're doing next. Yeah. That's all. Mm-hmm. But you know, there's only so much of that you can manage on other people's emotions too. <laughs> That's a whole different t- yeah. podcast. <laughs> people are hard. Yeah, yeah. People are complicated. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What you got, Frank? What I, well, I honestly, I uh, uh, I am going to have to learn how to better receive gifts and mm-hmm. better receive help from genuine people who mean it, who 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 offer, and um, and much to my surprise, actually actually mean to help. Um, I'm gonna have to learn that because it's imperative really yeah. for the growth and the development of whatever it is I'm doing, and I'm in a difficult position right now. It's an exciting one, but where there's there's so much opportunity, there's so mm-hmm. much, so many things to do and avenues to explore, um, and uh, I need help. And so, so it's 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 really a great opportunity for me to um, get to a place where I'm more comfortable receiving that, where I'm yeah. more comfortable sort of like exploring those relationships that I've given time to and nurtured within that community that want to give back to me, and my resistance to do that is just something that's oh, like has grown over time yeah. and has been always very difficult for me to do. Now my agenda, my hope is to ultimately be able to employ those people and ultimately be able to provide opportunities for people that are around me that have gifts and skills and talents and, 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 um, you know, things to, that would really complement what it is that I'm trying to do. Yeah. Um, I think that there's a place for, again, all of those things to rise, to rise together. And, and all those people to sort of to 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 have some ways in which we can complement um, each other's ventures and ideas and, and, and dreams. And so um, I want to get there as quickly as possible. But yeah. I think I'm going to have to I'm going to have to get some help to get there. And um, I have to be able and willing to explore that. And that's something that I think is I'm much more comfortable with after my experience at the burn. It's much more I'm much more comfortable with that when I experience people who genuinely want to give something to you without yeah. expectation for return yeah. and they genuinely want to help you with something because they see that you need help with it and that's I mean that's it's just, it's just, a, it's just what a wonderful lesson to learn from that environment and it's something that I want to you know I want to like contribute that back to the to burn community so, yeah so yeah I think that 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 that's kind of my answer there yeah no over overwhelmingly I can tell you in all the years I've been doing this show that's uh one of the very most common themes has been when we discuss gifting, um, people will share that it was a harder lesson to learn how to receive mm-hmm. than to give, mm-hmm. which mm-hmm. is pretty fucking amazing, right? Because like we're we're raised in the default world to believe that it's the opposite. Wait, yes. Well, yeah. Wait. <laughs> you know what? This is going to go sideways, but uh, um, <laughs> please. Yeah, you know, there's so much of our self worth tied up in. You know, we have to prove something. We have to give something. Mm-hmm. We have to, you know, our worth is determined by what we're giving, but not by what we're ge- yeah. receiving. Mm-hmm. Um, and that you have to be worth receiving something, right? So yeah. that's a whole other yeah, yeah. ball of wax. Well, it's okay. We're nearing the end of this conversation, so let's not open up another ball of wax. Yeah, yeah. I want to know uh, mm-hmm. 
what is the most counterintuitive business advice that you would share with someone? Whether or not they're a burner, it doesn't matter. Just like what is in your journey so far? What's like, it could be funny. It could be ridiculous. It could be heart wrenching. <laughs> just, but just counterintuitive. Like, huh. I want the listener to hear that go. I'm like, huh. And like chuck their head to the side. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Whoever wants to go first. I mean, for me, it's that it's, it's, what, it's, it's what we've already talked about in the yeah. sense that, John, what you mentioned, that, that ultimately, um, like in the, in the immediate or, or um, uh, you know, foregoing or, or sidestepping in some ways profit um, as, a, as the initial goal of what you're doing, mm. ultimately has a potentially profitable impact on your business. That, that ultimately you have that, 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 that just banking on that philosophy, mm. that collaboration and that spirit of, of, of giving and understanding and, and, and immediately um, acknowledging and, and listening to our customers and our clients and our employees and all of that, that ultimately those things in and of themselves are so good and they produce so, the, the relationships they produce are so much better yeah, yeah. that they ultimately can produce better profit yeah. in the long run as much as they might not in the short term. Yeah. Yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to... It's super counterintuitive. No, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share this. Well, this is funny because like talk about counterintuitive. I had my first call, uh, first or second call with my, uh, my financial planner recently who is not a burner. <laughs> and uh, he's a white guy named Chad. <laughs> and, Chad, uh, excellent. Yeah, because yeah, he's a... <laughs> White financial planner named Chad. <laughs> <laughs> Saying his name is almost redundant. Yeah, I know, it's hilarious. I kind right? of already knew it was Chad. Yeah. Um, and, and, and it's so funny because I've been approached by uh, a couple of other um, burner financial planners who have been lovely, amazing people I've had. But like my intuition did not immediately like connect with like whatever it was that I was connecting with this person. Um, and then I connected with this guy who is totally not a burner and totally in his own community and totally at, and, and I fully 100% believe that he was very much like, he's really into just talking about this topic <laughs> mm. and it was like very much like I'm here, like we're just going to do these things and at some point in the near, in the future, like we're going to go through all this stuff, we're going to organize your money, et cetera, et cetera. Some point in the future, if like, a, you know, finances come out of it, great, but he's like, I don't know, think about it that way. Like, this is just like what I do 40 hours a week as I talk mm. to people. And then uh, once every five years, somebody buys a product, mm-hmm. <laughs> yep. which is like pretty impressive. Like high five to that. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of um, you know content marketing marketing strategies mm. around that, right? Mm. Like you're just giving free content and providing value for people so that freemium they they come to you yeah. when they're looking for stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. right. I'm immediately gonna do it. I'm gonna go spend money with Chad. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it works. yeah, yeah. Uh, do you guys got One of the other things that just came up for me too is like the burner uh, idea of a duocracy. Mm-hmm. So when we're talking about hiring people and you know empowering them and you know facilitating their growth and stuff and not being and asking for help and like getting more people on our team, um, that that idea of Hey, whoever is willing to step up and actually get it done can have the job. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, if you get it done. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I I got a job once by just going to work for free for three months until they hired me. <laughs> <laughs> That'll do it. Uh, counter counterintuitive advice. Do you have anything, John? Yeah. Um, you know, it's been, I guess, kind of the theme of what I've been talking yeah. about, but people over profit yeah. and not just as lip service to that. Mm. You know, nobody is on their deathbed wishing, oh, I should, I should have just worked a little bit harder at the office yeah. over my life. Nobody's <laughs> thinking that. Everybody, like, in regrets that people have are in the relationships uh, that they missed sure. and the opportunities for enhancing those relationships. So if we take that same attitude and we apply that to our business, then and you and you're focused on the relationships both with your employees with your vendors with your customers and you try to enhance those relationships mm. the money you can't ignore it like you can't just you know you need to, you need a bookkeeper you need a CPA like yeah, you need yeah. to manage the money properly so you can't just ignore it but i would gladly sacrifice the profit of one of our jobs if i needed to in order to make sure that that customer was happy with the work that we did 
Right, right, right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and absolutely. Um, I couldn't agree with that more. So, yeah. 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 Don't focus on the, the profit. Yeah. Um, and if you focus on the relationships while you're accurately and um, managing the money side of things, then uh, yeah. the profit will come. Yeah. Uh, all right. I want a couple of geeky couple of geeky nerdy things <laughs> um and i will I, i'll start with some of the answers what is like your favorite project management app or service mm. uh i'll tell you for me like my entire life is a notion <laughs> i organize everything in there write everything in there on my checklists spreadsheets everything notion's amazing i'm pretty like Google Drive, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I don't get too fancy with those kind yeah. of things, but Google Drive got lots of spreadsheets, and you can have, yeah, yeah, Google Drive. We use a lot of tech in my business. Yeah. Uh, a lot of it is specific to painters, um, but Monday dot com is kind of like a workhorse for where we organize all of our production, and um, that's one that's like not specific to painters that anybody could get benefit mm. out of. Is uh, Monday dot com? We love it. Yeah. Monday.com. Hmm. What you got, Frank? Uh, I, I love this question solely because it's giving me ideas yeah. <laughs> and yeah. not because I have an answer to it. So <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and look up all of these things that yeah. you're using. I, I, I mean, I, it's interesting because I have um, all of a sudden somehow have a um, insanely Instagrammable business. Yeah. And I'm, I'm personally super resistant to, 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 to really exploring social media mm. and to being a presence on social media yeah. that often i'm a photographer and, and i hate instagram yeah, I guess. <laughs> yes yeah. exactly yeah. and it, it that's become that's really tough because again that's one way that i i really should be exploring it more and, and and exploring in better ways and probably need someone to work with me who who enjoys that stuff more than i do um and uh, but i need that person to understand the spirit and energy of the mm-hmm. of the of the work that we're doing yeah, and yeah. so if they do and if i can find that person if you're out there there's my shameless plug yeah. uh to find somebody who um who gets it and and um and uh can be that sort of forward face of the yeah. of the business and i tell you that is yeah. I, I, my that is the 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 business equivalent of a unicorn, my friend. Yeah, <laughs> like someone who loves being on social media and wants to promote to, yeah. the thing you're most passionate about. <laughs> yes, and, and, and that's you know, and it's fine if they're not as yeah. passionate about it. But I do need to under, them to understand some of the principles sure. that, we've, that we've talked about at length yeah. here. And and so so yeah, so that that would I think be for me. I, there's a lot of these social media, or mm-hmm. I mean, a lot of these sort of you know, apps and, and things yeah. that, that we, that I certainly can be exploring in better ways, um, that I need yeah. to, I need to get over some of my grumpy old man resistance. To, yeah. Do you even have a website to doing these things? Uh, it's currently in construction. <laughs> <Yeah>. Wow, <laughs> man. Construction. Come on. Uh, if you're Instagram, not selling, if you don't have a presence online, what are you even I, doing? He has, he has a presence. He has a presence. I know. Yeah. Website. Instagram, outfits and oddities. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so there is, there is a presence, but, uh, but that, that, that it makes it even more cool and underground. The website's going to take it to a whole nother level and I'm really excited about yeah. that. And so again, that's another area in which I need help. Yeah. And yeah. so, um, uh, but you know, I'll figure that out yeah. and, and we'll get there. And I, I appreciate actually, ironically, I kind of appreciated some of the truly organic growth that's been able to happen without having those things. Yeah. Yeah. And so, so I think that like, I'm, I'm fully ready to implement them now, but I, um, I actually, I have enjoyed some of the sort of interpersonal relationships that have developed as a result of not having that yeah, yeah. and having to explain my business in person to people as mm-hmm. opposed to having them be able to kind of like take a look and see what they think it is. Yeah. Get a sense of it. Yeah. yeah. Not a business related app, but since we're sharing apps and things, that are, yeah. um, mint.com is a personal mm. finance app yeah. that I just think everyone should know about and use. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> Mint's great. <laughs> it's free. Mint's I'm great. all about free resources. Yeah. If, as, if it's as free, it's me. Right? Yeah. As am I. As am I. Uh, all right. Final, final question. We're going to wrap here. Um, Make it a, a good one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> a piece, what is a piece of advice that you would give your, uh, it could be your child, your nephew, somebody somebody you're mentoring that is about to get into business that has not been covered in today's episode, doesn't even have to be connected to Burning Man or anything. Just what is a piece of advice that you would dispense? That is a good one. Good um, question. Yeah. Uh, hire a coach, hire a mentor, Ooh. find somebody who's already done what you want to do and learn from them as much as you can. Yeah. 
Yeah, you've talked. To, you've shared a few, a, a, quite a bit of that with me. You've had like a long journey with your coach now. I've yeah. been working with several coaches yeah. all throughout, um, and there's three realms of knowledge, right? There's mm. stuff that you know, there's stuff that you don't know, and then there's stuff that you don't know that you don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and it's that stuff, it's that stuff that you are yeah. operating with no even understanding or yeah, complete ignorance. it's completely ignorant to yeah. things that you're doing that are maybe like hurting you. And then a coach will point those things out mm. and a coach can help you fill in those gaps of knowledge and, um, put together the the missing pieces in your formula to be able to help you, you know, find yeah. the success that you're that you're looking for. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I will I will share. By the way, my mine on this one too. It just as you said that it occurred to me that I would I want to share mine. Um, go look at what people not in your industry are doing. Uh, mm-hmm. I'm really big into that. Like mm. I pay a little bit of attention to what photographers are doing, but that's like the least of my concerns. <laughs> mm-hmm. Like I'm really interested in like, what are musicians doing? How are they promoting themselves? Yeah. yeah. How, how can I take lessons learned from uh, an industry that I have zero interest in yeah. in how they're communicating with their clientele? Because you can f- fall into your own tiny bubble feedback loop, which by the way applies to burning, burning man culture as well, which is why we have these conversations. Um, because with photographers, for example, I can tell you like, Locally, I've had this experience of like the kind of like middle of the road gatekeeper creative professionals who are like, unless you're doing it this way and using this kind of lens and invoicing in this particular way, then you're not doing it right. And Mm -hmm. I had to learn to break past those things and see that like, no, you can you can kind of do it if you want to do it your way. In fact, if you want to be a business owner, that's sort of the whole point. You want to do it your way. Yeah, <laughs> yeah absolutely. Yeah. And f- so like looking at other people within mm-hmm. within your industry or other industries that are doing something a certain yeah. way and not necessarily just applying those those lessons directly, yeah. but applying them in ways that uniquely utilize your own yeah, skill yeah. set and yeah. your own way of doing things to possibly change those games yeah. and change them for a way that, you know, that actually yeah. sort of I, maybe impacts those industries and those, yeah. and, you know, and those communities. Now, I, I can tell you like right now, an example, what I am working on is that uh, as a photographer, there's like the portfolio structure, there's Instagram, and then there's like having an artist CV, which is like a common ways that like fine art professionals will promote themselves, you know, at a... Uh, and I'm, I'm working on an EPK electronic press kit, which is typically like DJs and musicians have. So mm-hmm. taking it from that angle, but, uh, but yeah, Frank, Don, do you guys have something? Um, I did, but I had more of a question about your EPK thing. So how is mm. that different from a website? Uh, EPK is easier to like pull up and access. It could just be like in a couple of like four or five sheets. It can be forwarded as like a PDF. Oh, it's a yeah. little more concise and so yeah. less memory. Whereas like a website, every time you go to a website, it's like this whole new like communication language you might have to learn. Yeah. Gotcha. But yeah, your final piece of advice and we're going to wrap here. Oh, yeah. So um, it ties in kind of to Burning Man. So like when people share with me that they they have an inkling, they're interested in Burning Man. I'm mm-hmm. like, you should go. If you're interested, you should go. And I have the same kind of advice or, you know, words for people who have a business idea. If you have an idea, go for it. Like, you know, you have to think it out and do your due diligence and, you know, make sure you're not just selling to your homies. But, um, yeah, go for it. It's just business. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. It's just money. Bias to action. Go as it comes. Bias to action. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. Yeah, I think that the, uh, for me, it would be that this something that I've been exploring quite a bit over the last few years is this concept um, that everything, absolutely everything, whether, whether it's personal or, or, or in business. Um, so in terms of advice that I would give to somebody like my, a child or somebody who is mm-hmm. coming up in, 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 and, and that I wanted to, them to learn maybe this one thing yeah. um, that I think would, uh, would, would apply to life in general, but also to business is everything is a gift. Like everything is a gift from the personal relationships and business connections that work out and blossom into something to the ones that go absolutely nowhere. Yeah. To, from the from the the sales that you make to the ones that you don't, from the successes to the disappointments, like all of those things present in a in in, in the way of a gift that you can draw something from right that there's something in every one of those things that and if you pr- approach those things you that the disappointments don't 
look like disappointments that much anymore. They look like an opportunity for, for, for growth or some mm. way to develop. And so, yeah. so everything is a gift and it really is. And you, and, and when, when you approach it that way with that attitude, then those, um, you know, those successes are successful and so are disappointments because yeah. they lead somewhere better and they make you, they make you, they, they force you to grow. And, um, so yeah, so I think that's really the advice that not only would I give, mm. but that I constantly remind myself of, um, every day and, and, and every one of the interactions that I have with people. Yeah. Yeah. God, that's really a, I wish I could find it. It reminds me of a roomy quote that I wanted to share. Yeah. Everybody knows <laughs> me. It's so good. Um, right. I'm going to find it. I'm going to find it and include it in the Thank you for putting me in that wonderful notes. company. Yeah. With yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm sure I don't deserve that. Uh, um, no, but I'll do it anyway. Yep. <laughs> 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 All right. Uh, I'm going to do the outro here. You guys have been amazing. Thank you so much for this amazing conversation. Uh, it, it really was everything and more. And we'll kind of like slip in here. We'll, you know, if you enjoyed this topic, mm -hmm. uh, Frank and I are scheming uh, starting a, a, a spinoff show of this podcast um, that is going to be entirely about this topic because it is a topic that I'm super fascinated by and I think it's important for the conversation to really, really keep going about uh, how we operate in business and finance and, and professional world um, and being, you know, good burners and how we can affect, uh, uh, this is going to open up a whole other can of worms, but how do we affect capitalism as burners? <laughs> um, but uh, is there a way to do it right? Et cetera, et cetera. You know, like this whole thing is an evolving conversation and I do want to support it. And, and yeah, Frank and I have been talking for a while about how we can do it. And yep. this episode came about and I would, uh, I'm excited about uh, you taking this and running with it and, and seeing where it can go and I'm future super show. Excited. Super excited to explore that yeah. with you and, and with the community. So, yeah. So, yeah. yeah. It's gonna be great. This is this is what they call on TV a backdoor pilot. <laughs> or like well, this whole great. this TV show starts with these side characters that showed up in this one episode. Like you know, so so uh, yes. So stay, stay, if you soon we we will have another spin off of this show into that topic. I'm certain it will happen. But stay tuned. Stay tuned. Uh, you are now listening to the sounds of Kenos. Yeah, this is, this is, I'm just doing the outdoor yeah. thing. I as I was saying earlier about how Ken missed the burn this past year and there was this giant photo of him and I can't begin to express to you how saddened I was that Kenos was not able to join us on Playa last year because every time a group of us bicycled past his massive photo towering over us on Playa there would be a tantrum almost a mild fit of rage if you will because my god how much fun would it have been to clown on him in the presence of this giant massive piece of him um, just unleash a snark flood of truly <laughs> biblical proportions of our dear friend um, because you know that's how we show our love of course I kid I kid uh, the Black Burner project was truly truly spectacular it was a massive success it was excellently executed and shout out to Aaron Douglas your vision is truly an inspiration and I am so looking forward to having you on this show as soon as synchronicity and alignment will allow it. And Kenos is one of our favorite human beings. The reason he didn't burn uh, with us this past year uh, was that he was busy nourishing and protecting the new human he's brought into the world. Uh, we love you, Ken. Uh, the set that you are hearing right now was recorded at Mickey Beach earlier in the week. Not sure which exact dates, but it was at Burning Man 2016. If you did yoga at Mickey Beach early in the week in 2016, you heard this set. You can find this and all his other music over at soundcloud.com slash ear of Kenos. That's E-A-R-O-F-K-E-N-N-O-S. Uh, please share this episode with three friends. That's that's how we're promoting it. <laughs> just just like text to them or post it on social media. We don't advertise this show, so the following we have has all been built entirely on word of mouth from you, dear listeners. And for that, we thank you. As always, you are invited to pitch interviews in your neck of the woods or throw some dough in the tip jar. All of these links are over at burnerpodcast.com, where you'll also find more podcasts not hosted by me, maybe soon hosted by Frank, and other hey. cool burner shit. <laughs> Burner Podcast is produced by a revolving team of volunteer burners, including Louis Gallopo in Toronto, Canada, Lee Hemingway in San Diego, California, Michael Seth Prell in Austin, Texas, and our newest team member, Jasmine Perez in Los Angeles. The Burner Podcast theme music, America's Horseman No Name Remix, is produced by Joe Man, now in Austin. Find more of his music over at soundcloud.com slash DJ Joe Man. Until next time, love, light, and all that other crap. 
Take us back to Playa, Kenos.
burnerpodcast.com. Ooh, all right. I am recording. Fuck it. We're, fuck it. Fuck it. We'll do it live. You all ever see right. that? All right. Why Have you not? ever seen that? Bill O'Reilly screaming, fuck it. We'll do it live. <laughs> We'll do it live. Fuck it. He's like throwing paperwork. It's nice that you're modeling yourself after yeah, Bill O'Reilly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, as a media host, like his politics aside, he the man is a massive success. You know, like that's a pretty big aside that you have to. Put yeah, yeah, it's true. Is yours on? Where are you? Where are you at? I'm not hearing you like at all. Not even the room. Not even the. Uh, it's usually it's an indicator. Try that again. Try talking. Try and yeah, there you are. There you are. Okay, you're number three. That's why. Ah. I, I I accidentally lowered it. Yeah. No. Uh, uh, yeah. Number three. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, you know, coincidentally, there's this uh, thing I was reading uh, recently that I really enjoyed, where they found that like, uh, that I'm gonna mess up this study a bit, but like basically they found that long and short of it was that bronze medal winners tend to be like happier. Than the gold uh, medal yeah. winners, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, pressure. There's a lot of pressure yeah. on one, and and there's a lot of disappointment with two. Yeah, yeah, you know? right. So yeah, whereas like bron- people that aim for bronze apparently tend to be like a lot happier. They're like, I'm up here, like, yeah, I <laughs> made it to the podium. <laughs> yeah, this is yeah. great. <laughs> there <we go. laughs> whereas like the ones that are going for like gold, if you you could miss that by like a minute and trip right before you know like mm-hmm. the the whatever. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Happiness is a funny thing. Huh? Yeah. Yeah, this, this, see, it's shit like this is what we're yeah. going to talk about. They used right. to say that money doesn't make you happy, but then there's a big study that shows that it does. So. <laughs> well, it's like a, there's like an exact dollar amount, right, that you get to, and then after you get yeah. past it, you don't um, you don't register it as more. Right. Uh, I don't remember what the number is, but that's what I remember. It's always changing, but it's like right around where like you have all of your like needs mm-hmm. covered. Mm-hmm. So like 80 grand in San Diego is like right about the number yeah. that I've heard. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I used to tell students when I worked at the university, um, like that, that was one of the big things we always talked about was that as you go through your career, you're going to reach a point where what you're doing in your life and how you can like take trips and go out to meals and all that yeah. stuff, you're going to be happy yeah, at a yeah. certain dollar amount and then you're going to make more. Yeah. So what do you do with the rest of it? Right. right. Like, do you yeah. stay at that level or do you jump up every time you get a pay raise? Obsessively so, pack it so, away until you're a billionaire. Yeah, there you go. There you go. <laughs> and save it for future generations of like people. Like a you'll dragon learn. sitting on a pile of gold. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'm going to do visual. I'm going to do the intro thing here. Uh, hey, it's episode number 139. Oh, by the way.